Well, welcome to the Author Spotlight series for the journal Case. Um, today, I'm having the pleasure of talking with Dr. Rebecca Steppen, who is the Clinical Cardiovascular Medicine Specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, she's also an associate editor of uh, Case, has been involved in Case longer than I have. Uh, so, Rebecca, welcome to the Case Spotlight series, and uh, I'm really pleased to have this conversation. I think the journals are going to enjoy and, and learn from. Well, thank you, Vince. It's a pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. And again, for the people who are getting a chance to see this video with the QR codes in the background, you could just pull your phone up and link on those. It'll it'll bring you into some uh, recent veterinary papers in the journal and some figures. Um, so just have fun with that as we're going along. So um, I guess to start with, I'd love to hear from you as somebody who's kind of new to cardiovascular veterinary medicine. How, how did you get trained in this? How, what is the training process like? Well, uh, the training to be a veterinary cardiologist and to be board certified as a veterinary car cardiologist is typically four years of regular vet school, like every veterinarian, uh, followed by a year of rotating internship and rotating through all the medical and surgical specialties in the course of a year and then three years of a cardiology residency. And then at the end of that, we take a comprehensive specialty board exam to become board certified, and then you are a veterinary cardiologist. Currently, there's about 400 uh, veterinary cardiologists in the United States, but there's also colleges of veterinary cardiology in Europe and uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know, so there are cardiologists all over the world. Okay, yeah, but it sounds like it's, again, pretty rare relative to the adult human world of uh, cardiology. There's a few more of us out there. Yes, it absolutely is. And there are some states that have zero veterinary cardiologists in them. So uh -huh. uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people clustered on the coasts and um, around veterinary colleges, but uh, not necessarily in some of the wide open spaces. Very interesting. And I know that... Um, you know, in the world of cardiology, right, we really sub sub specialize to a crazy degree. I'm mm -hmm. curious if you have a particular interest or pathology. And I'm also curious about the field. Um, is the field out there incredibly sub specialized as well? Uh, well, I'll take the second part first, I guess. It's really not, um, at this point, very subspecialized. There is some talk at the minute about um, developing fellowships in interventional uh, cardiology. Most of our interventions are, uh, at this point, are for congenital diseases, but we also are developing interventions for mitral valve disease, which is very common in veterinary medicine in dogs. Um, and so the subspecialties are not as well developed and the cardiologists as graduated and as board certified um, are expected to pretty much cover it all. Uh, everything from putting in pacemakers and doing interventional cardiology to medical cardiology and, and various sorts of specialized imaging. So we're, we're pretty broad. And of course that um, also includes multiple species. So we look at cows and horses and other uh, what would be considered farm species, I guess, but as well as zoo animals, uh, pet exotic species like birds and lizards. Uh, so it's it's a pretty wild, wide field and you're expected to know a little bit about a lot and a lot about a lot. <laughs> uh, that seems like an incredibly wide group, right? I mean, I would think the person coming to do the echo on the, I mean, Kentucky, so I think of horses, right? Uh, right. That person's got to be skilled differently than the one that's doing, you know, the small whippet or the, the poodle or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely true. And down where you are, there are some very high level uh, uh, equine veterinary cardiologists that are are working in various practices and the doing getting the getting the echo images varies among animals and you can imagine that doing a bird is very different from doing a horse uh, and so getting the images is difficult but interpreting them is actually pretty universal and that's why we enjoy uh, working with the human uh, case reports and and various publications and things because uh, once you've got the images, the interpretation is actually fairly universal, and we learn a lot from your interpretations and hope that you're enjoying looking at some of our interpretations. Absolutely, and I think that's an area that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute regarding to sort of the, the value that CASE brings to the veterinary world and how it matches up. Um, I'd like to follow up again on that uh, area of your particular interest. I think, and if, you're not, if I'm not mistaken, you've mentioned to me in the past your interest around mitral valve disease and its progression to heart failure and athletics. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how that plays out in your day-to-day -day practice. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question, basically, because one of my, my interests is whippets, which are very specific dog breed that 
interestingly has an intersection of mitral valve disease and, and athletic training. Uh, but myxomatous mitral valve disease in dogs, which is sort of a disease associated with aging, very common in small breed dogs, but seen in every size of dog, uh, is just a super common disease. And I'm very interested in, in the imaging of that and decisions about treatment and how we can assess the uh, uh, success of our treatment using imaging specifically. Uh, but as far as the athletic things go, I've always been interested in the effects of athletic training on the cardiovascular system and the heart in particular. Years and years ago, I did some work with Iditarod dogs in Alaska, uh, imaging them before and after a year's worth of training and running the Iditarod. So the, the actual race is a, a little bit over a thousand miles, but the training is about five months of training to run a thousand miles. So those dogs are, are quite tremendous athletes. And, and we found quite a difference in them from when they were untrained at the beginning of the season in September. And then when they came back from the Iditarod, their hearts looked quite a bit different. So that was fun. And then um, just recently, we've been characterizing the athletic changes in whippets and whippets like greyhounds are dogs who have been bred to be athletes. So their hearts even in an untrained animal looks different from the dog off the street or you know your household uh, uh, pet. So they're they're very interesting. And then when they get trained up, their heart is is pretty amazing. So we're uh, that's kind of something that I've been watching over many many years in in different settings, and it's been very interesting. That's great. I I'd, I'd love to think through this idea, right? Because yeah, Diderot dogs. They're not just endurance, but their strength as well. So I assume they have that increased wall thickening combined with maybe some eccentric hypertrophy and dilation as well, or? Yes, that is exactly it. And, and I entered into that, that study thinking it was going to be a runner's heart. So very much eccentric mm -hmm. dilation. And they came out with both eccentric yeah. and concentric and their hearts look like rowers, which made me yes. happy because I used to row in college. So I was very happy about that, but they are very much a mixed training. And then of course I was like, had that aha moment where it's like, well, yeah, they're dragging a sled. They're yeah. not just running. So they really have uh, strength training as well as their, their um, long, long, long range running. Very cool. So, so again, as an adult echocardiographer, where I spend most of my time, we use 3D echo, we use strain, TTE, TEE. Tell us about in your, your patient cohort, is that also tools that you use? Uh, yeah, well, it's it's a combination of what's available and what's necessary, I guess, for us. The day-to-day -day bread and butter is radiographs and echocardiography, pretty straightforward echocardiography, sometimes with uh, um, saline, agitated saline contrast in congenitals and so forth. Uh, we we have and, and use uh, CTs, MRIs, TEE for intra-op uh, procedures. So we recently put a stent in a dog with PS, and the TEE was extremely valuable for getting that. The dog had a, a partial um, uh, dissection of his pulmonary artery. So it was really helpful to be able to see what the stent was doing with that dissection and much easier to see with TEE. And our, uh, we have some colleagues in Colorado who are doing pretty high level interventions, including mitral valve adjustments. And they're using a lot of that kind of imaging. For those of us who have the imaging available to us, it's a choice of, what specific question we're trying to answer. Because one of the things that, that is true in veterinary medicine is that not all of the patients, in fact, very few of the patients are insured. So the patients, uh, the clients have to pay out of pocket for whatever we do. So we're pretty specific about the questions we ask and, and the modalities we use. When they're available, we love it. Reconstructed CTs are so much fun, um, but uh, uh, not everybody gets it either because of finances or for some cardiologists, availability is an issue, but they certainly all have been used and you've seen some of them in case you see some of the images that are out there um, from people who are doing pretty high level imaging. Well, I mean, I've really enjoyed, I think, watching some of these cases because I think sometimes they just shock me at how much they look like my human friends. And then yeah. other times it's like uh, the boxer recently with all four valves that were stenotic. It was yeah. like, wow, I haven't seen that in a human. And so I think, you know, we learn from seeing those. And I'm curious about you and your colleagues looking at, for instance, like the case journal where you see a lot of these other diseases that are not in animals. How do they help you guys? Well, some of it is just having a chance to see an image of something that you think you might be dealing with and you want to see what it what it 
might look like. Uh, so the, the searchability of the case images, I think, is really helpful for us. And we can go in and say, hey, that's what that tumor looked like in that person. Is that what we're dealing with here? So that's super helpful. Um, and so I think we can, as I mentioned earlier, you know, getting the images is the difficult part, but the interpretation is quite the same, uh, whether it's a human or a dog or a horse. So uh, we're pretty happy to have these up there for comparative purposes. Great. And do you sometimes like reach out to your human cardiology colleagues uh, for assistance? Tell me about that. Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, we're lucky enough at the University of Wisconsin, where I work, to have just a fantastic pediatric hospital. And the pediatric cardiologists are just a font of information when we have complex congenitals and we may get their advice and we may actually get their hands on help uh, to do some of the interventions on these congenitals. And then the adult hospital, we're making use of our friendships with their cardiologists, their electrophysiologists, and their radiologists. Uh, so we borrow some of their imaging sometimes, and it's great stuff. So it's it's a great relationship, and they enjoy seeing some, you know, the the things they see, but only more so in animals, and uh, and we enjoy getting their help. Great. Um, so let me ask. I guess one last question is case specifically um, as a form or a format for publishing veterinary cases. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And, and where do you think we can go with this? And why is that a good location to land? And tell me your thoughts about that. Yeah, I, the, the, I've really enjoyed working with case personally, but I know my colleagues who have had things published and, and have been asking me about it in various venues are really appreciative of the one medicine aspect of case now with the veterinary input. Uh, that we're all kind of learning from each other and having a chance to see, to do a little bit more comparative among species uh, and, and be able to use the knowledge that other people have worked so hard to gain to help ourselves. I think from a, from a veterinary standpoint, another uh, great option for this is that it gives our, our colleagues, um, my colleagues in veterinary cardiology, an opportunity to publish really interesting cases. And it's, it's like one of those situations where you see something that is the most amazing case, has great images, but you can't really just publish a case of something. Uh, this is an opportunity to say, wow, look at these images and look how it changed what we do in this case and how important the imaging is. And uh, we appreciate that it's not only echocardiography uh, that's featured in case that we do have other opportunities to show other types of imaging as well. So it's been great. And I know that the, the people who have published, um, the veterinary cardiologists who have had papers published have been super excited about it and very grateful uh, for the opportunity. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to teach us all about this. I know I'm not alone when I say that this has been really educational to me. Um, for everybody out there that's viewing this, we really look forward to reviewing your next case report, whether it's in an animal or a human. Uh, those submissions to the journal are something that we really live for. So um, I'll leave you with my motto, which is remember every single echo that you see today has a teaching point and every teaching point is a potential new case report. So thanks again, uh, Rebecca, for your time. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Vince. It was a pleasure.